We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and we are tired. Extremely. I knew this was going to happen when I left Argentina. I was going to have to conform to the, you know, um, extreme sport of watching F1 in the U.S., and <laughs> I failed. I fell asleep. <laughs> I couldn't do it. Granted, I do have a sick dog at home, so I've been up for, like, the last 48 hours with him, but regardless, yeah. it's a hard one to watch. Yeah, my, my alarm went off at 3.30. I didn't get to bed until, like, midnight, so that was really great. I did nap after the race, as I threatened that I would. Um, oh, I and then I also went. That's okay. <laughs> You did. Yes. And and then I went to a baseball game that went four hours in extra innings because of course it did. And now we're recording a podcast that I will be up late tonight editing and then I will go to sleep whenever this is done. So this is this is quite an action packed Sunday for for the both of us. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I did absolutely nothing because I'm so, and I'm still exhausted. But you know, yeah, trying to keep two dogs alive is a lot of work. Yeah, I'm house sitting for my parents right now, and so I have their dog too. And he's a two year old. He just turned two. He's a Springer Spaniel poodle mix, so he's a sprudel. And this dog has more energy than anyone or anything I've ever seen in my entire freaking life. And we just got done throwing the ball for like two and a half hours, and he's still just staring at me like, What are we going to do next? Are you going to play with me? And my 14 year old dog's like laying. And just like, please get him away from me. So yeah, that's what I did. All yeah, time. but I mean, it's it's kind of like Oscar. You know, Oscar's just like, yeah, you know, this happened. It was a little stressful. Which also, Oscar's reaction to this race was like peak Oscar Piastri, which I love. I just I love him. I yeah. Let's just get into it because I know we want to talk about a lot of different things. But before we get into the race. Let's do a little follow-up on contracts. So we didn't have any contracts during silly season, essentially. So now we have, yep. like, kind of... All of them. All of them. I mean, there's no silly season anymore, and we're only talking about future years. So go team. Um, That's the pod. But allegedly, <laughs> unconfirmed. Helmet Marco is kind of hinting that V-Carb will announce its second driver in Singapore. Which I'm interested to see who it will be. I think it'll be Danny, but I don't know. I mean, based on his performance, like, no, he's not, he hasn't really been in the points since the summer break, but based on his performance, like, this is the direction that he's been trending in. And, you know, yes, I, I also think it's probably going to be Danny, but then there's the other question of, like, V-Carb is still supposed to be a junior team. What are they going to do about Liam Lawson? And, you know, to skip ahead a little bit, like, what does this mean for the second Red Bull seat? Which, yes, Perez has a two-year contract, but we all don't really believe in the oh, the longevity of this two-year contract. So there's still it's not so real. much up in the it's air. It's so fake. I, I don't it's, think it, it's... It's written on a piece of baloney, Catherine. Like, this is not real. Yeah, it was so, signed by Dumbledore's wand. Like this is where I'm at with the two year contract. I mean, especially yeah. after today. Like, no, get out of here, Checo. You're done. Yeah, and I mean, if that's we'll, the we'll case talk about that, that I later. I'm doing but... like Liam Lawson and then moving Danny up, but then like, I don't know. I I understand it's like a junior team, but if they have a driver who's he's not doing horribly, like he's not DNFing, yeah. he's not crashing out. He's in contention for some points. He's making it into Q2 sometimes. Like, and I wouldn't say that Yuki has been performing stellar lately either. Like, this car no, is just not, not performing. So it's really hard to judge if he should get another contract, like, for another year. Speaking of Danny, like, it's really hard to put his future in the hands of an un uh, underperforming car. Right, right. So. so the answer is maybe we will know more in Singapore. Hopefully we will know more in Singapore and this God, mystery I can't wait will for be solved. Singapore, Singapore is going race. to be so much fun. I, I love this race. Okay. But before we get to Singapore, let's talk about Baku. Because Baku had its moments and mostly like 
whether whether you enjoyed you know wh- whether things went well for your driver or not one of the really things that i really liked about this race was the fact that it was exciting from lap let's say lap 20 to lap 51 or let's lap 50 well we don't need to talk about we know what happened in lap 51 um which is something that i really do like to see and like that's what i like about formula 1 is when you have a lot of action happening especially in the front of the grid no, I completely agree. Normally, and we've been saying this, like, all the action has been, I would say, between, like, P9 to P15. Like, that's where all, right. like, the close racing is and the overtaking, who's going to make in the points and who's not. And I would say these last few races, like, that fight has moved up and up and up and now we're at the very top. Like, granted, Oscar kind of, like, did go away with it um, towards the end, but in the, like, middle section, I would say, of laps it was really close for almost half, like up until you got to Alex Albon. And then he finally pitted and then people could finally yeah. get around him. But it was super tight, super close. Everyone was in DRS. I I really liked it. And the presenters kept saying like, this is what we've been waiting for is to have like multiple constructors in the top, you know, six duking it out, trying to make it to the podium, which I agree. I mean, but it also goes back to say like, Max's dominance did not ruin Formula One. It just made everyone work so much harder to get their car to be more competitive. And look what we got out of it. Like we got such a good product from that situation. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and Oscar just, he ran a really great, really clean race. He he got it. Like that overtake he had on Leclerc was just oh, so beautiful. Nice. And and he he was able to stay ahead, stay ahead clean, and then was able to finally break that toe. And he, I wouldn't say he took off because by the time he was able to break the toe, like there were back markers in front of him, which is like, you know, the steak cars. Right. But, you know, he he got ahead and oh, it was it was not one of those situations where you didn't like you weren't sure that Oscar was going to be able to, you know, pull it out in the end, which is kind of what we had happen with Oscar's first win, which, you know, was very overshadowed by McLaren not knowing what to do with themselves and, you yeah. know, how to how how they were going to handle both of their drivers being as competitive as they, as they are now which leads into uh papaya rules uh we really talked about that all week for that not to matter papaya rules or papaya's rule that's the yeah. question i'm posing i mean grit i think it's just they had to make the bl- the blanket statement because that's where lando is in the championship and right. they are performing as a team and like Role, if roles were reversed, it is what it just so happens that Oscar qualified really well and Lando did not. But going into Singapore, they're going to be following Papaya rules. Like, even though Oscar is doing really, really good, he's not there in the championship points. If he was, then Lando would be supporting him. Right. And I think it's really, it's all, you know, predicated on both Oscar and Lando's performance. Because if they're putting together, you know, the same performances, and obviously it's going to lean in favor of the guy who is trying to get to the driver's championship, which is going to be a little bit harder based on, you know, the, Lando didn't pick up a lot of points today and Max was still able to pick up a, enough points to keep moving ahead. Obviously the lead is, sh- you know, shrinking, but he's still ahead. He's still, you know, scoring points. And then, but, you know, if they have these different performances, like, you know, L- you know, Lando, say what you will about the the flag issue at the end of Lando's qualifying, but Oscar will still have his opportunities to shine when they don't qualify near each other. No, of course. And the thing that's hard and sucks is, like, Oscar's not that far behind Lando. Like, yes, there's a gap, but it's not like he's sitting in P20 of the Drivers' Championship. You know what I mean? Like, he's in fourth. Yeah, no, he, he's he's in a, a pretty decently close fourth. I mean, I don't think that he's right. going to be, you know, he's not going to be making a charge for, for Lando or for P2. I mean, he, like, he might get Charles if, you know, Ferrari, but, you know, Ferrari's still running very well right now. So the, right. It, there, there, it could be a chance that one through four, Max, Lando, Charles, and Oscar does not change between now and the end of the season. Right. My big question that I was kind of thinking of is like, what if this happens again? Because Oscar has been pretty consistent these last few races. Lando didn't qualify well. 
what if he doesn't qualify well in Singapore? Singapore is so hard to pass. You can't pass. So if he doesn't qualify well, and let's say Max doesn't do well and Oscar does pick up a lot of points, what if Oscar ends up flip-flopping and, you know, is now leading in front of Lando? Like, do they reverse orders and say, we're going to be pushing for Oscar and Lando, you're going to have to take a back seat and push to help Oscar? I you know what I mean? Gonna, yeah, and, and I think what's going to happen is that just based on the fact that we are running out of races and running out of, you know, points to score, if it gets to the point where Oscar is suddenly doing better than Lando, then it's just kind of be like, well, we're just really happy that we're gathering a lot of points to win the Constructors' Championship and we'll, we'll, we'll focus on the Drivers' Championship next year. Because I don't, I, I, I know that, the, you know that all the top 10 drivers are still in contention for the driver's championship but i don't know how necessarily easy it is because i haven't done that math for oscar to you know no and to that's try fair. to put it to max no and that's fair and I, I just think it really opens up that question of like this is a p- real possibility and max didn't do great today and we know he doesn't do great in singapore so this exactly. is exactly it's, it's a real i wouldn't say it's inevitable but it is there's a remote possibility that papaya orders like has have to, to flip. switch. Yeah. But I, which, just, I don't know if they would, or if they would keep pushing Lando. I don't know. And it's the same thing of like, you and I are very much on team. Oscar is the better driver of the two papaya drivers. And like, how much is that influencing us and our, you know, thoughts on this, you know, but, you know, compared to reality, let's say. I don't know if I think Oscar's a better driver in this moment in time. I think Lando's an extremely strong driver and is very consistent. But even though I just called him inconsistent just because he didn't qualify well today, but or yesterday, but I just I think it's hard when you have two drivers who are very, very good and so close to like their abilities to like favor one over the other. Like, I right. think if, I, if we take a step back and think, like, okay, because I see Lando as Zach's, like, golden boy. You know right. what I mean? Like, chose him over Danny, favored him over Danny, everything was for Lando. Now he yep. has Oscar, who they're like, oh, well, he's a rookie, we're gonna have to, you know, help him out. First rookie year, like, wins a sprint race, he's won two races this season, doing really, really well, not driving like a rookie. We were talking about this earlier, he's so talented beyond his years and his experience, like, it's insane, and so what if he was the one who had the more more points? Would they really be like, oh, well, Lando's our, you know, number one driver, but we don't have a number one driver? Or would they just push Oscar? It, I mean, you can think about it a million ways till Sunday. I just, yeah. I don't, I, if Zach is the one that's making these decisions, I don't know if it's based on, like, talent and loyalty or just, like, his such big, like, his huge urge to, prove everyone on the grid wrong that he's the best you know what I mean yeah no and I I think we can't answer that question because we can't read Zach Brown or Andrea Stella's minds um and and those are you know those are the ones that are really making these calls and so the real the Obviously, and we didn't really talk about this a lot, but there's also the question of like what happened in Lando's qualifying, what, you know, what was with that yellow flag that was or wasn't, you know, the, you know, the screw up there that really, you know, also plays into the fact that Lando had to really fight to get from P16, which turned into P15, which turned into P4, and to, to make, you know, make his charge through the field. Whereas Oscar was just like, I have one overtake to make, and then I'm just going to keep defending until the cows come home. I mean, yeah, but look where Lando was. Like, he, we all know the McLaren is a much better car. You can pass in Baku. It's not that difficult compared to, like, let's say Singapore or, right. um, or Monaco, Imola. right? Or Imola. Or Monaco. Um, and so you can make, you can easily overtake. I don't want to say that overtaking is easy, but it's easier than some of the uh, other tracks that we just mentioned. So, like, yes, he had to make up some ground, but he had to get rid of, like, cars that have no business that he has no business racing and those cars know that that's not their fight so like if i'm you know who's in front of him an Al- 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 albon yeah so if i'm albon i know that's not my fight so am i gonna defend to the death probably not you know what i mean and that's that like said albon on- still pushed back a lot <laughs> of the field including lando yeah no that's fair that's fair but let's okay 
but, but you but, uh, you're, but your, your so point a lot of is times correct they come on team radio and they're like hey that's not our fight like quit quit your shit keep the car in a good position and like save your tires save power whatever right so it's like that comes down with team orders so with that being said how hard truly was it for him to make it through the field till probably what the first mercedes you know what i mean yeah yeah There's so so many questions not taking um, away the fact that he overtook like 12 cars because that's really yeah. great for him but yeah just, he, he had I'm a good strategy i'm questioning how hard all of that was and how much defending he really encountered yeah no no you're you're not wrong but anyway the point is is that oscar won this was oscar's day he really got to celebrate this time it wasn't overshadowed by Correct. you know team shenaniganery and his mom fan favorite nicole piastri was in attendance she doesn't go to a lot of races in yeah. fact this might be the first race that she's gone to but she was in attendance she got to hug him right after the race um she's not really going cool. she's canceling pilates and it's really exciting for her that she was able to be there for that yeah, I honestly, when I saw her, I was like, there's no way. Like, this woman does not come to races. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if it's because, like, the timing of day, night was just so bad in Australia. She's like, I might as well just go. Because no, Australia race... and, and Azerbaijan are not as bad as, like, 4 o'clock in the morning in Arizona to I Azerbaijan. I honestly think this race is the race every year where it's, like, horrible timing for everybody. I mean, for the most part, unless you're in Europe or you're in a country that's like adjacent to Azerbaijan, yes. But I, I think that this was one of the races that it was in the early, like mid morning um, mm. in Australia. I think I think I, I try to tune out a certain Sky Sports presenter that isn't named Harry Benjamin, but I think I do remember them discussing that at, at one point during the race. I wonder and Harry if, Benjamin did a great job covering for Crofty. He did. He did. Yeah. I wonder if Zach flew her out because that was like his whole thing. He's like, if you want to come, we'll get you here. Yeah. <laughs> like, we want you to be here. Because we see Lando's dad in the garage like all the time. Um, yeah. With his little headset on. But um, but yeah, it was cool to see Nicole there. Happy for her. Anyway, to move on, can we also make the point that Charles Leclerc has been a four-time pole sitter in Baku and has lost Baku from pole in the, each of the last four years? Because it, it's like, like you said right before we started recording, he ditched the Monaco curse just to pick up the one in Baku. Yeah, I mean, we all know I'm the Fer Ferrari fan of the podcast, but like, I just can't get behind Charles. And I think it's because like, he can't perform in big moments. Like, he, how many years did it take him to win Monaco as a Monegas driver, like, in a Ferrari so in a good car? So, it's just, like, he, he chokes in every, like, big race. He can't perform in big moments. He doesn't handle the pressure well. Maybe he does, and it's just, like, the luck of the draw. That's my observation and take from it. I just can't buy in like I just I feel like every time I do want to root for him I'm so let down and like when he got pole I was like oh my gosh he's really really good at qualifying here but can we convert and the answer is no we can't granted P2 no. is good he's on the podium still but I don't know it's disappointing yeah, but to see. like you you could see very clearly the moment his tires just came off that cliff yeah. And just completely, like, they completely died. He almost got dragged into the the Checo-Carlos dogfight. I mean, Checo had been on his, you know, on his back for pretty much the entire race. And, you know, there were moments where, like, Checo was, you know, one, two seconds behind that was clearly just him biding his time. And then, you know, he he really did almost get dragged into that dogfight. And, you know, that yeah. could have been, that could have been bad for him. But fortunately, he maintained P2 so that your least favorite driver only managed to, to luck out into P3 and somehow ended up on the podium in George Russell. Like, Okay, before we get to talking about George Russell, I just want to go over the radio call that he made. I don't know if you heard it, but it was like he's sitting in like P12 or something, like insignificant. He's like, so uh, when do I start my attack? And like, when are they going to pit? And like, when are we going <laughs> to yeah. start? And I'm just like, buddy, like, shut up. No one wants to hear you. Just, he's so anonymous and, like, somehow ends up on the podium. And, like, is so anonymous well, I mean, that's and somehow, Mercedes like, wins for you. I know, they're sneaky points, but I just, I don't, I don't get it. 
get it. And he's been qualifying so well lately that's just like pissing me off because then he's like, oh, I'm projected to be on the podium. Rah, rah, rah. Yeah, but it, it's I also just, like Lewis. Lewis looked like really bad today and he had a brand new engine in the back of his car and he still managed to luck out into the points thanks to the to, to the incident. But it's it's like, I, I wouldn't say that Mercedes had a great weekend. I would say that Mercedes got lucky this weekend. And then to go well, back to I your point. I would say Mercedes had a Mercedes weekend. Like yes, they didn't do anything and points. they both got points. Yeah. Yeah. And then to go back to your point about radio calls, there was one radio call from Charles where he was asked about, I think he was asked about plan C and he, he said, stupid. <laughs> No, no, he I, he said like either that's stupid or that's not stupid. But he, but I, I thought it was really funny because Baku is the place where Charles crashed and had that "I am stupid" radio call, and I feel like he did that on purpose. <laughs> that. Yeah. Oh my. Honestly, it'd be funny if he did. But he's going like what three hundred and sixty kilometers per hour. Like I don't know if his brain is functioning. I mean, sometimes, sometimes I don't, sometimes I do wonder, and then you get radio calls from like Fernando Alonso in Miami a couple years ago, where he, or not a couple years ago, last year, where he's like, I will not let you put him in the same category, because Fernando is so different. I know he's completely different, but it's also like, I'm watching a Formula One race while also driving a race and giving my teammate uh, strategy. This pretty good if you want (laughs) to tell me. Yeah. Oh, really nice overtake in quarter seven. Yeah, exactly. Okay, but here's the thing. Here's the difference. If that were Charles, he'd be like, oh, tell Carlos. Guys, I'm okay. Sorry about the car. It's <laughs> literally what the radio call would be. Yeah, yeah. But, but anyway, like, I, I thought that, I, I, I felt like there was a little bit of, like, the that's not stupid bit was, like, I think that was intentional just because it was in Baku. But, yeah, it was... <laughs> It was a it was a wild experience of a race that we had. Yeah, it was really good though. The fight at the front was really exciting to see, especially because um, it lasted so long. Right. Normally, it's like a few laps, and this was felt like half the race. So it, that was, it was it was honestly like thirty. Uh, but to get in, like to go off the podium, but in the points, I will fight you to the death to be number one in line, to be captain, chairman, president, CFO, CEO, COO of the James Val fan club. I am so bought in on Williams. All right. I'm so excited. Like, my boy Carlos is going there next year. Hopefully it's going to go good for him. Like, this is what we wanted to see out of Williams at the beginning of the year this year, coming out of a strong second half of the season last year. This is where I thought we would see Williams, like in the points consistently, both cars. Granted, yeah. Logan Sargent did leave. We have Franco Colapinto now, and I am so excited for him. This He's a child, basically, but he, like this kid, is so good. So yeah, good. He, I'm so impressed he, with him. He qualified really well. I mean, he he ended up in Q3 for the first time in right? one of the more challenging tracks on the calendar after no notice. And he has scored more points in one race with his, his finish um, than Logan's whole career. And, like, that's not, like, anything against Logan, but it is a fact that, like, in two races, he has four points from one race. And Logan had one point that he was, you know, by promoted default. into by, by default. default because it's of the coda. It's an point. It's um, not real. <laughs> yeah, because of the it. coda disqualifications, which it was also the last time Williams had a double points finish was last year at the U.S. Grand Prix in Austin. Yeah. This is huge for them because Franco ended up in P8 Eight. Yes. and Albon was P7. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So yeah. that moves Ten them up points now. for Williams. Yeah. Right. Which is huge. Oh, I'm so happy. That's for a them. lot of money. Like we it talked is. about this. That's we so talked big. about this last year with Alf- Alfatari now V Carb. Like Danny and his points in Mexico. You know that gave um, Alfatari millions of dollars in prize money because they were yeah, able to move huge. up a position. Williams went from P nine; they're now in P eight with sixteen points in the championship. They're three points up on Alpine, um, who have thirteen points, and they're only thirteen points behind Haas. Right, and if both of them can continue to race well, Albon, I feel like does pretty well on street. Colapinto seems to be doing it fine. Singapore's a street race. 
Yep. I mean, I think it'll be a challenge. It'll be uh, Franco's first, like, night race, so that's going to be different. Singapore's, you know, notoriously so, difficult. Yeah. Um. So we'll see how he goes there. But if he can get into... Here's the thing, though. If he can get into Q3 and qualify well, then I feel like he can end up in the points because of how hard it is to overtake in Singapore. Yeah, exactly. He just has like, to qualify well, which if, I think he can. It, it, it's like you have to do really bad in singapore during the race if you qualify well to drop back and, and, and right. to drop back far and i'm really excited to see what williams will bring to this track obviously you know every track is different um you know monza and and baku are tracks that suit the williams really well singapore should be should be good for them but you know it's really exciting to see this progression that Williams is finally making especially after where you know where we started with them in like Miami and China because those were those were some rough weeks and I think it's hard like I mean this is what we want like I was saying earlier this is what we wanted to see and I feel like if Williams had two cars racing consistently every weekend they would have been able to really invest in the upgrades instead of fixing cars and getting a right. third chassis and they would have had better feedback because they have two cars racing consistently so they can see where the upgrades need to truly be um right. and i think that's really gonna help james next year lead the team because he'll have alex albon and carlos signs who are more consistent drivers and he won't have a rookie now they can all DNF and crash. That could happen to anybody. But I think those two drivers are more consistent than having like Logan in the car. So having consistent drivers, consistent feedback. I think that'll really help them develop the car next year. Yeah, yeah. This is this is exactly the type of trajectory that Williams, that Vows is like wants to be on. And like this is this is what we want to see out of Williams. And this really does give us, you know, a reason to be optimistic for what they're going to look like next year, especially with a driver as talented as Carlos Sainz in the car. Right. And it just like, it blows my mind to see the Williams car because Albon has gotten into Q3 several times, races really well, but then never can like get high enough in the points because for them to drive as well as they did this weekend and look as good as they did this week, like the car looked great. Besides the Q3 issue with Albon, um, we'll talk the about car that later. Looks great, and for them only to be in P8 and like barely up on Alpine, who we've been like just hammering the of. shit all all season because they're terrible. Like that is so surprising to me that that's where they're sitting. Yeah, no, fully. Like you, you think? Well, it, it's interesting because you think when when. Williams has a race weekend like this and like last weekend in Monza of like, oh yeah, they should be way further up or they should have more points. And then you have like those bad weekends and you know, the really unlucky weekends and like the, the weekends where even Albon doesn't do well. And, and you're just like, oh, Williams, maybe next year. But now we're getting to that point of the season where Williams like starts to kick up to that next gear. Right. And I think it's really good to see, especially because of the beginning of a season where Like, Logan had to sit out and Albon took his car because they didn't have a chassis because he binned it. So, for them to start there and be here now, I think is so much growth. And I, as sad as it is to see someone get their seat taken away halfway through the season, like, it's not surprising. And I think they made a really good move. And, like... I knew who Franco was a little bit, again, just because, like, my Argentine friends, but I kind of, like, gave him the shove off of, like, yeah, sure, sure, you just like him because he's Argentine, whatever. But, like, he's actually really good, and I am, like, yeah. also his number one fan. Actually, no, I have to get behind, like, every Argentine, but, like, I'm in the fan club. Yeah, and it's very much, like, with his performance, every, you know, after 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 Mons, it's like, okay, you know, yeah, he had a good race. Yeah, that was a good performance, but, like, we got to wait and see. Well, now we just had, you know, one of the more difficult tracks on the calendar. And it's like, we waited, we saw, and we were really impressed. So it's like, oh, yeah, James Vowles did make the right decision because we weren't going to get this type of performance at Baku out of Logan Sargent. Oh, exactly. And it's like, was it beginner's luck? And like, that brings me to the next person who was really good this weekend was Ollie Behrman. Like, right. when he took over for Carlos and ended up in the points, it's like, oh, that's great. But like, is it beginner's luck? 
all this adrenaline and like you know and the fact that he was in a ferrari and he was in a ferrari yeah exactly like was he just lucky but in the Haas, which we know is not a super strong car, he got in the points. He was P10. Yeah. That's super exciting. And not exciting. only that, but he's the first F1 rookie driver to score points for two separate teams in his first two races. Because obviously this is, you know, a very unique situation. Nobody yeah. ever expects the Spanish Inquisition, let alone <laughs> Carlos Sainz's appendix deciding to burst <laughs> in the middle of Saudi Arabia. But, you know... He he showed he showed off what he can do in that Ferrari, and and Haas took notice, and Haas said, you know, we want you, and obviously that made him the correct you know choice and the only choice to replace Kevin Magnussen and his cute little race band. But not only that, but he outqualified and outscored Nico Hulkenberg, who yes is an outgoing Haas driver at the end of the season, but he's going to you know what will hopefully not be as much of a trash fire disaster as it has been this season with steak. And then to Audi who, you know, may or may not be the next, you know, coming of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm still out on that one, but yeah, I think the interesting part of this weekend, and I, I feel like I heard it in every free practice was, and especially because it was like a Komatsu weekend. So it was like, have you thought about Behrman taking over K-Mags for the whole season? And they're like, oh, right. no, no, we haven't. And like, oh, but this would give you a lot of time to like work with him. And like the it all really truly boils down to is like his contract. If his contract wasn't there, like I wouldn't put it past him to do that, especially because he got in the points in his you know first race. But I don't think they're going to pull K-Mags and, and put Ollie in there permanently. And I don't think they need to. I also think that the the people that were asking those questions about, like, would they replace K-Mags permanently were trying to cause drama for the sake of creating good headlines and good stories. Well, also not Harry Benjamin. That's not but... necessarily, like, yes, but I also don't necessarily agree with that because it, like, logically goes through your mind, right? Like, Ollie signed on to be the driver next year. This situation came about, and he has to step in. So, like, logically, someone would think, because it did go through my mind, too, of, like, oh, or would they just keep him for the rest of the season? Like, K-Mags is out. He's not having a seat next year. He's not really driving for a seat. Who cares yeah. about him, right? Like, he's neither here nor there. This gives him more practice under his belt for next season. Like, that could be a good option. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, but I, I, I think they. That. I I don't I don't disagree with you either. You know, I I know I'm I'm taking both sides of this, but I I do think that the way it was framed was more of a That's clickbaity fair. type type of way, where it's like, yes, it would be considered, but like the way that it was presented on the broadcast of like. So you're, you, you, why wouldn't you be doing this? That's what I don't like from certain presenters, not named No, and, and that's fair. Like, but I think he was doing his journalistic due diligence of having Komatsu as the team principal that weekend. He had the obligation to ask the question. No, fully. He fully Could had he have the asked obligation it better? to ask it. Yes. And yes. was, was it framed to like, not in the best way? Maybe. But. If he didn't ask the question, it'd be like, you have him on the radio. This is your whole weekend. Like, why didn't you ask the question? Yeah. I also thought it was like the the team principal this weekend, like just in general, you know, Komatsu was very much an afterthought because he really wasn't on the broadcast as much as like other team principals are throughout the weekends. And, you know, that might just be a like, you know, Komatsu only really wants to, you know, do is like the little bare minimum as, as possible because obviously not all team principals partake. We don't have anyone from um, from Stake this year. You know, Christian Horner's not doing it do, this year for do we all need of reasons. From stake? Uh, we definitely don't need anyone from steak. Um, we had someone it, from Alpine until they were canned. <laughs> uh huh. As, as they are canned every year. Right. Well, and I think so. I saw them talking to him more in the free practices. I think they didn't necessarily I also didn't go watch to two him. Of the free practices. Yeah, and I don't think they went to him much in the race because Haas was like not really in it, and there was so much going on. Like, if this was a Zach Brown weekend, I feel like we would have had him basically broadcasting with everybody on Sky yeah. Sports but it's Haas and they weren't necessarily like in those fights so and like that's right. why it doesn't make sense when they have someone from like V-Carb or from Haas like when it was Gunther I know they talked to him because Gunther was Gunther but I feel like that was like out of courtesy because he was a character but it doesn't right. make sense to have you know team principals from teams that are 
in, non-significant to the weekend. Right. They're not and adding like, any value. Like, and then you try, because, like, you can't predict these things. And, like, these things are also scheduled, like, way in advance, give or take some weeks where they're like, hey, we have to get this guy in. Because, like, if you look at behind the scenes, we have, you know, Drive to Survive was with Haas this weekend for obvious reasons, um, which I cannot wait to see Drive to Survive's coverage of just Ollie Behrman in general and Franco Colapinto and everything that, you know, that's happening this weekend in Baku. I think that th- that should be a good episode if they, like, are smart, which Drive to Survive doesn't always present things the way that, you know, Formula One actually happens, which is one of the other reasons why Drive to Survive is, you know, a primer, but that like doesn't even, you know, take account for like the real thing. I just want to say if they do another five episode montage on Alpine, I refuse to watch another season of Drive to Survive. That's just my two cents. But we we don't we don't need All we need from Alpine is the Monaco incident with Gasly and the fact that he gets fired. And also uh, Bruno Faman getting fired again in in Spa. But that's, like, that's all we need out of of Alpine this year. Yeah. Anyways. Okay, so let's talk about the elephant in the room. Um, Carlos and Chaco decided to, like, just (laughs) ruin their weekends. Yeah, both of them. One lap to go. And yeah. they just, oh, it's so annoying. I mean, it's either here nor there of who caused it. It was a racing incident. No one was blamed. Red Bull's obviously going to say it was Carlos. Ferrari's going to say it was Jeco. Whatever. Yeah. It is what it is. It looked really bad. Like, the impact. And the the cars looked completely destroyed. So I'm glad everyone's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's just, like, these, you know, one lap to go crashes just absolutely kill me. Yeah, and especially considering the fact that, like, I know you, how you feel about Checo, but Checo had a great weekend this weekend, right up until lap 50. Yeah, no, it he did. I I mean, was he? I, it's sad that we say great and he's, like, fighting for podium, but, like, he, he made it to Q3, right? Like, he's not... He made it to Q3. He outqualified Max, and we'll talk about Max in a second. And, you know, he was he was in the fight for, you know, he, he was going to be in P3 all the way up until Carlos said, you know, I would like to be in P3, and that was on, okay, like, lap that 49. that overtake was so good. Oh, no, no, it was great. Don't get me wrong. The overtake was great. Uh, and, and the way that I, I wrote this in the rundown was, like, this, and obviously it's a little bit different because this isn't between teammates, but I, I, I said this was what would have happened in Monza 2023 between Charles and Carlos if that in that like that racing and the way that they were racing if that went bad um that's what was this incident here in Baku well so this is what I would have expected from like Piastri and Leclerc how close they were fighting all race like that's where I would have expected this to happen or between like Checo and Leclerc like I never saw Carlos and Checo getting it like because they were really truly only fighting for like four laps you know what i mean it was everybody else and so for them to do it to each other like one lap to go it's so frustrating but yeah and then like to and then of course to end the race under a virtual safety car obviously there wasn't a lot of race left and we've had races that have ended in similar situations before that had just been like worse you know australia 2023 comes to mind um which was also like way worse for a lot of other reasons but it just it really and I don't want to say it overshadowed anything because it obviously didn't overshadow Oscar's win because it was just like he oh Oscar's just like I'm 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 in the freaking clear now which was great but yeah it, it was just like you had you know 30 laps of full-on full tilt excitement from basically the moment Oscar overtook Charles and then Carlos and Checo they crash and it just comes crashing down and you just go from like a 10 to a two yeah poor oscar can't just like win can't just win and, on like, his own be overshadowed by something else yeah um, but no i think then- really really good racing yeah, and then the, the other question, and you and I, we, we talked about this before we started recording, is, is Checo back or is this just how he races in Baku? I mean, I don't think he's back. I think it's a fluke, honestly. Like, when we get to Singapore, I would not be surprised if he, like, is out in Q2 and gets, like, P8. 
Like, that's what I'm expecting from him. Well, actually, no. I'm going to take that back. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets in Q2 in Singapore and doesn't get a point. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely, it like, remains to be seen because, like, he was just, like, in the toilet for so long and then all of a sudden it's like, wait, what are you doing fighting for the podium? And, like, not even fighting for the podium, but, like, almost fighting for P2 and the win if he had, you know, managed to, you know, overtake though he was waiting to see what was going to happen between Charles and Oscar because Charles and Oscar could have easily gone bad and that Checo would have had the opportunity to do what George Russell did do which was wait and be patient and then take advantage of what was going to be presented to him obviously that didn't happen because you know Carlos came from the back but I I also agree I don't you know obviously as a Red Bull fan it's nice to see you know a Red Bull doing well on a weekend but I I'm not going to get my hopes up and I'm not going to get too excited because it comes to the fact that I still think that Red Bull needs to move away from Sergio Perez, no matter what he does throughout the end of the season. Can him. No. And I mean, just in general, I wouldn't, I'm not going to say like I'm concerned, but I'm not bought in on Red Bull. Like, and I'm not bought in that Max is going to win the driver's championship. Like he's still struggling with his car. He didn't have a great weekend. Checo is doing better than him this weekend. I don't, and like we said before, he doesn't do well in Singapore. So, yeah, I see the gap between Lando and Max shrinking from Singapore. I do too, um, but I don't think it's going to shrink enough for Lando to get too close. Like, I I don't necessarily maybe not know Singapore, if- but. Like, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure if throughout the rest of the season, you know, Lando's going to be able to close the gap enough. Um, That's one of the things that a lot of people have been talking about, especially going into, you know, Lando's, you know, qualifying incident this weekend of like, is, is he out? Which, you know, we, you know, we don't know. I haven't done the math because my brain is fried after today, but I don't know is is really the the moral of the story I do agree with you I think Max is going to struggle in Singapore because Singapore hates Max Verstappen but I I also did say to my dad that the crash did play into Max's favor because it moved him up two positions because he would have finished P7 obviously a P7 finish and a P3 or P4 finish from Paris would have been good constructors wise for Red Bull But from a driver's championship standpoint and the fact that Max needs as many points as possible, even though Lando did finish ahead of him, did play into Max's favor in the driver's championship, you know, despite the fact that he is continuing to struggle. I think that the car looked better um, for for both of them. Um, And I think that this has to do with the the new floor elements that they brought to Baku and that they're going to continue bringing to Singapore and Kota. And I think that that will help and, you know, as as a as the Red Bull and Max Verstappen fan, hopefully it does help that he can do enough to um, maintain his lead. And it also does remind me of Jensen Button in um, in LeBron and how he had the great run of form to start the season and then just had to cling to um, to be able to to win in two thousand nine. And I feel like that's what we're we're seeing here with you know max and and what may or may not happen to him with the driver's championship going to the end of the season yeah i mean honestly i think constructors is done like it's gonna be mclaren because yeah checo can't finish a race and max is like struggling so i just i don't see them no red bull's focus back. right now is is max. keep it is keeping max in the front of the driver's standings and the mexican telecom buddies better uh pony up those checkbooks for the amount of um lost prize money is, is all i'm saying which is still an alleged rumor yeah i don't know i just i i know you think that max can do it but I, he d- I know you say he looked better in the car. The car looked better, but he was still struggling. Like, it's not perfect yet. And I think no, he's getting not. frustrated. So, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. We'll, we'll see. Um, yeah, I but I also don't think we're going to see a, a lot of improvement between, you know, now and Singapore. Because Singapore is in a week. Um, and, you know, because... Like I said, like the, I, I don't think that this is the year that Max is going to figure out how to how to make Singapore happen for him. No, absolutely not. 
I don't think I truly I know we're getting way ahead of ourselves talking about Singapore so much, but like I don't think Red Bull is gonna have a good showing in Singapore. I don't think so either. So yeah. All right, should we get back to Baku and talk about our predictions? Yes, let's talk about our predictions. Perfect. Okay. So you scored points this weekend. I Congratulations. Did. Thanks. Um which to be fair, we were I think we both picked like really good contenders for P10. I do too. Like the but we were both really on it and at you know, before the crash, it was going to be you. I know. I was going to say that. I feel like I should get, like, half a point because I had it before the crash. (laughs) I had it up until lap 50, but it's okay. So, okay. So, yeah. So, let's just jump to P10 because we've already talked about it. So, you picked Behrman. I picked Colapinto, and it was Behrman, so you got three points for picking that correctly. Colapinto, though, did get P8, which is super exciting. So, like, I lost three points. I'm happy that he got more points. Um. And then going back to pole, it was Charles Leclerc, which, like, neither of us saw that coming. No. We should have, though, because he's gotten it three times, but we didn't. Um, yeah, we, we forgot Oscar about the fact that Blando. he's the, the king of, of qualifying in, in Baku. Um, but then, you know, can't, can't, can't win. Can't win there. Yeah. And then for podium, it was Piastri, Leclerc, and Russell, and that was nowhere close to anything that we did. No. Nope. So go team so current standings for our prediction picking Catherine's at 28 and i'm at 17 i have seven more race weekends there's still time there's still time i got one of these i'm just gonna get you got lucky once you got every like everything right and that's just been the differentiator so yeah it's okay um okay so then for biggest surprise which we just do for fun you said that red bull was uh they were both going to be in the top five um yeah Max ended up there by default and checo dnf so yeah nope i'm i'm not giving myself that i am so happy i got mine right i said williams was gonna kill and get a double points weekend and they did um i'm so excited we are like james val's number one fans i'm just he's so great I'm so excited to see what he does with Williams, like continues to do with Williams. Um, so I'm really happy they had a good weekend. And yeah. then for who's going to do a dumb, you said that Mer- the Mercedes floor was not going to be an upgrade. It was going to be a downgrade. I don't know. I feel like this one's hard because. I I also feel like I get half credit for this because Lewis okay. looked like crap for 95% of the, 99% of the race and then managed to take advantage similar to, to how yeah. George did. And he ended up in P nine, but he was nowhere for most of the race. He couldn't overtake, you know, Haas's and Williams. And he had a brand floor, new engine in the or car. Or was that just him? You know what well, I mean? Well, the question is like, he, like he had a brand new engine in that car. So it definitely wasn't because, so for context, uh, Mercedes introduced a new floor in spa that caused them a ton of problems. And so coming into Baku, they decided to go to the pre spa floor spec. Um, and it worked out for them in the case of, they both did finish in the points and George got a podium. Um, but then Lewis also ended up taking a new engine components. He started from the pit lane. He looked like trash for 90% of the race and then ended up in P9. I mean, you got, I know you are, you are, since we're talking about fan clubs, you are the number one fan of the Lewis hating fan club. So I understand what you're saying, but he started from the pit lane and he got points. Akon started from the pit lane. Where was he, Catherine? I don't see Alcon. I don't know. I don't care about Alpine. <laughs> did Al- did did Alcon even race? Where was Gasly? We Is Gasly don't know. In Singapore. We don't know, and we don't care. But I yeah, love. Well, that. Okay, I just want to pause here. Well, really now quickly. I need. I, I love- need to know now. <laughs> I love that Alcon had to start in the pit lane because they lied to the FIA about <laughs> what parts they were changing or like they weren't truthful and they didn't tell them everything. Like, yeah, God, they just can't get their house in order in LP. They really can't. No, Gasly finished P12 and Alcon finished P15. Alcon was one of the two drivers that was um, lapped by, by the leaders. Um, that was Alcon and Botas in 15, 16. And then everyone else was DNFs. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, what is Alpine doing? No idea. And the answer is we don't care because we don't care about Alpine. But if we get five episodes next season on what they were doing all season on Drive to Survive, I will, I will scream and I will pull all of my hair out. Um, I will throw hands. Okay. And then 
to get back to uh, who did a dumb, I said Checo. I said he's going to come back from, like, being king of the streets and I'm so good and Baku this, blah, blah, blah. And he's just, something's going to happen that and he just, like, did. messes everything up. And I give myself full credit for this because he did. Something happened and it messed the whole thing up. Like, if he wasn't racing that hard to try and, like, prove that he's, you know, I'm Checo, king of the streets. I feel like it may not have happened. So, yeah, I mean, what would have happened was he would take. have given up P three to to Carlos, which like, right? I understand why he wouldn't want to do that, but yeah, he it was it was it was he was really trying to cling to that and ended up getting overtaken He's by trying both. Trying to make Fetch happen, <laughs> he was trying to make Fetch happen, uh, but yeah, no, I I see I see to your point, and I give I give you full credit for our non scoring. Who's going to do a dumb picks? <laughs> Honestly, we should score these because I get these right more you than I get. You do so much better. <laughs> I do so much better on these. I'm just going to start yeah. keeping track of my head. But final thoughts. I think it was a great race. I think it's so good that we have such competitive cars. Thank you, Max, for stopping for, you know, running away with last year. This year, we've had so many different winners from so many different teams. We are having great fights at the front to make podium. I'm very happy with how this year has progressed. Yeah, I I really like where Formula like the, the state of Formula One is good right now, and I I really enjoyed what we saw this weekend. This was a, a very early morning and a but also a very you know fun race, and I I really think that we are in the position to have a bunch of really good, really fun races down the stretch to Abu Dhabi, and most of them will not be at four o'clock in the morning for me. I know. Most important. Oh, I can't wait Though for Singapore and Mexico. When we, get, when, we the hit day. That, when we hit the Americas, I'm just like, yes, Austin, Mexico City, Brazil, let's do this. Like, the yeah, Singapore. Bread and butter. <laughs> Singapore is the last worst, like timing wise, worst race for me. Like, I can do six a.m. Six a.m. is fine, but it's Baku at four a.m. and Singapore at five a.m. are the, my like, le- two least favorite moments. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. I'm going to hate Vegas. Well, actually, no, I won't be here for Vegas. I can't even watch Vegas, but no, Vegas is a hard one, too. We will have a special guest in Vegas, TBD. Yeah, forward-looking. Emily's going to miss more of the season. Oops. <laughs> Anyways, so let's get to my off-track moment. So we're starting this new thing where I pick a funny or cool or interesting thing that happens off-track during the weekend to compliment Catherine's fun fact she usually has about going into the race I have something fun that happened that weekend coming out of the race so this is not necessarily like a a happy thing but it's hilarious and I just want to know like how does this happen so Alex Albon in qualifying made it to Q3 which is super exciting um both Williams made it to Q3 but then he was not able to really get a lap in because he had to try and dislodge a fan from his car. So he left the pit too early. A mechanic had the fan, had to step out of the way so he didn't get run over by the car. And then yeah. the fan is still in the car and he had to like pull over on the side of the pit lane. And he's like trying to like finagle it with his hands and like get it off and he's like hey can someone touch it but if they touch the car then like he can't do anything can't do that so yeah so he ended up like trying to get a lap in but he didn't have enough time to make it around and get off before you know checkered flags so he ended up not being able to put in a lap time in q3 which is unfortunate um but kind of like a funny like WTF moment of like how does this happen? <laughs> yeah, so. and like to to your point of him trying to finagle the the fan out himself. And first of all, thank goodness that that mechanic was not injured in any way. Oh my god, that would have the been video was so terrifying. That, so scary. Like there there were like inches between him that like the car and his leg. Oh, but god. like ha- the with the way that these drivers are seated in the car and like they're basically like sort of like lounging, like their feet are up, and like that's just a way the cars are configured and there's not a lot of range of motion no. with like the seat belts and how they're strapped in and yes the fan was like above his head but it was above and set back and he's got this giant helmet on top of his noggin so like trying to like fin- like watching him finagle getting the fan out of the air duct and then not wanting to just yeet it out of the car because those things are expensive and Williams is not made of money and all of that was just like 
of all things to happen. And then he, he also said after qualifying that like he probably wouldn't have made much faster of a lap than what he already had in Q3. So he wouldn't have moved up, you know, any like much further position wise anyway. Um, but it's still, it was just like, oh, like how does that even happen? Like how do you forget that giant fan sticking out? It's neon yellow. Well, I don't think it was that. I think someone told him to go too soon and he just yeah. went. Or, yeah, like, there was a or the guy holding the fan, there. like, wasn't paying attention. There's definitely a breakdown in, in columns. But I, like, I the entire time was just thinking, like, oh, Yuki could never. <laughs> <laughs> of all the drivers, it's Alex Albon, who's, like, Who probably is one the of the taller, he's one of the he's taller one of the tallest drivers. drivers on the grid. Yeah, but I think, like, Esteban Akon might be, like, taller than him or something. But he's one of the tallest ones. So I'm like, oh, yeah, that kid's got long arms. He can, he can reach back there <laughs> yeah. with the Phantoms. Like, but Yuki? Never. No. No, he, he Yuki could never. could never. And it, and I just, I remember watching the car come down the pit lane before we realized something was wrong on the broadcast and being like, there's something different about well, the Williams. And the, the, presenters couldn't, the presenters couldn't figure it out because they're like, why is he going so slow down the pit lane? And then one of them's like, oh! He's still got a fan. <laughs> There's a fan in the car. <laughs> oh, yeah, that man. was that was that was it was it was good that it it turned out okay and that like nothing was injured, no one got unnecessarily penalized, so that we could laugh about it in hindsight. And yeah, Yuki could never, never. Also, like the word I'm looking for. What is it like when you don't get something, but it's like oh oh honorary mention. That's what I'm yes. looking for. So honorary mention for my off track moment of the weekend would have to be Lewis Hamilton's fashion choices um, and just drivers in general. I don't understand. It was hot in Baku this weekend and they're all showing up in like heavy sweaters. I just I want to challenge them to wear those heavy sweaters <laughs> in Singapore next week. If someone shows up in an overcoat or a sweater in Singapore, I will lose my shit, Catherine. Like, I get its style. I get its fashion. But, like, make it make sense. The math is not mathing. Like, the Celsius do not provide you with a temperature to where you would be like, oh, yes, I need this massive sweater. So... I that mean, my fashion rant for the week. We as well. we have we have had the the fashion rant, fashion rant discussion multiple times, and the the answer and it's is the Mercedes garage. Fashion always. is weird, and and what is is Tommy Hilfiger put making making those children wear? And by children, I mean you know these these grown men. And Lewis Hamilton is older than I am. But anyway, what 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 are they making them wear? Oh hey, I don't as know. I sit watching Sports Center, here is is Sports Center's recap of Baku at seven forty five at night. And there was Oscar Piastri's overtake from lap 20 um, of Charles Leclerc. All I'm saying is the, the Carlos overtake when Checo was fighting with Charles was. Yeah, no, they're so about good. to show the crash. They just showed the crash. There's a oh, the crash. Nice. It happened. Okay. Well, yep. coming up, if you don't know and you didn't listen, it is Singapore next, which is this weekend. Yay. So we will have our prediction yeah. episode out on Thursday, which is super exciting. And I'm excited for Singapore. It is the OG night race and it's the OG night street race. I love it. It's so cool. It's so hard. It's really hot. I'm looking forward to it. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what Lewis Hamilton shows up wearing on Friday. Yeah, I'm I'm just Singapore is just such a cool race. It's very challenging. Singapore's um, top three for me. For sure. I, fully, fully, fully top three. And I, I am really excited. I am not excited to wake up at 4.30 in the morning to catch the race. But, you wow. know, that is, that is, I, I would do that podcast or no. So it's not just because we have this podcast I that I am putting it. myself through this nonsense. I am weird like that where I would not. Um, and I would watch it live, but that's just, you know, if we know how I got into Formula One, none of this is surprising. And this if is... you... If you know, Kevin you and know. I, yeah, Kevin and I were talking about this earlier. Like, if you are an American F1 fan, give yourself a round of applause. You, too, are competing in an extreme sport. Like, yeah. the lengths we have to go <laughs> to watch is insane. Yeah. <sighs> and, that, you know, I love, but to my core, I love that F1 is not conforming to Americans. <laughs> like, you know what? No, wake you up. You have to suffer. In the morning. <laughs> suffer. Yeah. Uh, all right. I think we've gone off track enough today. 
Yes. This is what happens when neither of us sleep. <laughs> but that has been our Azerbaijan Baku recap episode. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.